Thank you. It's a tremendous pleasure to be here. You could boil that all down realistically. I'm just a Christian brother trying to make sense of it all. And what an extraordinary time in which we're called to live. It's an enormous pleasure to be here. Jenny and I have been to New York probably a thousand times. She used to live here before I knew her. But I have never been here on Sunday. So having known Tim Keller for many years and appreciated this extraordinary church and its ministry all over the world, this is actually the first time that I've been here on a Sunday and able to be with you. So it's been a tremendous privilege. Thank you. One of the great turning points of World War II was the Battle of Britain. And both before and after that battle in June 1940, Winston Churchill made two of his greatest speeches. The speech before it is the more famous, and it's called by the words of the last line, their finest hour. But after the war was over, and certainly after the battle was won, there was a burst of intellectual activity among some of the leading Christian intellectuals in Europe about another line that Churchill had said in the speech, not so famous. Churchill simply said, the Battle of Britain is about to begin. Upon the outcome of this battle depends the future of Christian civilization. And after the war, T.S. Eliot, Jacques Maritain, Christopher Dawson, Emil Brunner, and a whole host of the Christian intellectuals had a strong debate. What was particularly Christian about the victor? What did it mean that any civilization was Christian? How was it that the Christian faith was linked to civilization? And what were the prospects for restoring a genuine Christian influence in civilization today? Now, what's interesting is that the same debate broke out after World War I, although a much more secular discussion. Historians who'd picked up Jakob Burkhardt, H.G. Wells, Arnold Toynbee, Oswald Spengler, and many others raised the question about civilization again. Now, as we look back more than 60 years after the second of these debates, you can see on the one hand where they were exactly right. They were at a moment when the fragility of civilization showed through and the underlying barbarianism was obvious. But on the other hand, any hope they had of restoring civilization has not worked out. In fact, we could say bluntly that those discussions are what we might call sunset debates. Just as the sun is most colorful and most glorious just as it sets, so there are many debates in society which are most intense because the topic under discussion is actually beyond recovery, a sunset debate. We are today a long way from Christian civilization in the West. Now, both those debates came back to my mind last year when around much of the Christian world there was a discussion on our ability to, quote, change the world. Many for 30 years had blithely talked of turning America around, making a difference in culture, changing the world. A couple of weeks ago in the back of CT there was an advertisement for one of the leading Christian colleges which simply said, where world change begins. And for a long time, people have blithely made that claim. And a famous book came out last year saying, no, you can't, unless you're much more realistic about what cultural change really means. But can we, should we, really seek to change the world? I want to address that this afternoon. Now, what I'm not speaking to is the crisis. You could easily argue at many levels about a divided West, about an American Republic on the verge of potential decline, about the weakness and worldliness of the church in America, 
We could look at various aspects of the cultural crisis, particularly in the West. But I want to assume much of that this afternoon and say, if that is so, what should our attitude be? Is it, as the gentleman was arguing last year, that we resort to nostalgia or defeatism? No, obviously not, as people of faith. But what does it mean to move potentially into something of a new darker age, if not a new dark age itself? Let me set out a number of thoughts in connection with that, arguing for the possibility of a Christian renaissance. And I'll say more about that at the end. First, bear in mind the grand global tasks of the church in the global era. As we look around the world today, the Christian faith is the world's first truly global faith. We are the most numerous faith on earth. The church is the most diverse community on earth. In many, perhaps most parts of the world, we're the fastest growing faith on the earth, not Islam. And our growth is through conversion, not demographics. And the Bible is quite simply the most translated and translatable book in all Christian history. But the church is doing magnificently well in the so-called global south and far from well in the advanced modern world, the so-called global north, Europe and the United States in particular. But that leaves us, you think, with three grand global tasks. The first is to prepare the global south. What is done in the church in the West is capitulation to the modern world which the church helped to create. Much of the global south is pre-modern, so there are challenges coming. And anyone who sees the remarkable growth of the church through the gospel in China, where I was born, for example, is the epicenter of the explosion of the house church movement, or in sub-Saharan Africa, Anyone who knows that story, which is real and encouraging and inspiring, knows that much of the growth is a mile wide and an inch deep, as the Archbishop of Uganda put it recently. One of the African bishops was telling me, with the thousands of converts, largely untaught, face a problem, say a husband has an infertile wife, he immediately resorts to his pre-Christian recourses going to the witch doctor, or taking a second or third wife, and not in the crunch following the way of Jesus. Or as a Chinese house pastor said to me, many of my congregation are only two unanswered prayers away from leaving for something they consider more effective. And you can see the crying need in the global south is for discipleship to match the evangelism and a discipleship that is aware of what's coming with all the challenges subtle and overt of modernity. The second grand task is to win back the West. Many people look at the discouragement of the church in the West and are discouraged and defeatist. But if you think we are the product of two, not just one, two earlier missions to the West. The first, of course, was the conversion of Rome. 300 years, an incredible achievement under the Holy Spirit. But the faith of what the Romans would have conceived of as provincial misfits would replace the ideology of mighty Rome itself. But when the Western Empire fell, so also did much of the Western Church. And less well known to Christians in the West today, is the second mission to the West, the so-called conversion of the barbarian kingdoms. Now, we who are European in background need to acknowledge that while, say, the Chinese were civilized for thousands of years, we were barbarians, violent, bloodthirsty, warring, tribal. And it was the gospel that gentled us but the winning of the barbarian people to Christ is an extraordinary story. Patrick, in Ireland, 
Columba in Scotland, Columban, down through Gaul, and so on. But of course, we're now living in the twilight of that second mission to the West. And the challenge before us today, do you commit yourself to a third mission to the West? I was misquoted a couple of weeks ago talking about a third conquest of the West. God forbid the way of Christ winning the barbarian tribes was the gentling of the European people. The cross, as even Heinrich Heine the poet said, was like a taming talisman that cooled down the berserker rage. And he predicted when the cross was no longer powerful in Europe, think of Tim's sermon this morning, when the cross was no longer powerful in Europe, that berserker rage would burst out again. And he predicted that almost exactly a hundred years before we saw it burst out in the Nazis and the fascists in 1930. Do you believe that we could win the West back for our Lord again? over the next hundred years. The third great task is to contribute constructively to the human future. We're moving into what's called the crunch generation, particularly for those of you in your 20s. In your adulthood, many of the world's questions, the global issues, demography, the economic questions, the environmental questions, the nuclear, many, many issues, are coming together, and they will have to be answered wisely and well by your generation, or humankind will be deeply in trouble. Now, at such a moment, let's be frank, we followers of Christ are usually good at fighting evil. We have a long record, unprecedented in human civilization, of reforms, of standing against injustice and oppression, and we still have. But today we are less good at getting into the thick of many of the great issues of humankind, not just the great evils, and conceiving and articulating and struggling for constructive solutions to guide humankind forward to the future. Now I begin there because that's the backdrop of the grand global tasks of the church in our world. Secondly, explore the somewhat surprising relationship between the Christian faith and culture and civilization. A quick clarification of terms. You can define culture very complexly and the same as civilization. I don't want to make it too complex. You can equally put them very simply. A culture is simply a way of life lived in common. So you can talk about the teenage culture, or hippie culture, or the French culture, or the Hottentot culture, or whatever, a way of life lived in common. A civilization, put simply, is a culture with sufficient extension, it spreads widely enough, sufficient duration, it lasts long enough, and sufficient elevation, it produces things of sufficient excellence that people proclaim it worthy of a human civilization. Now, if you think of it that way, the Christian faith is actually the decisive factor in what's now described as the world's most powerful civilization, if only because our civilization is now globalizing the entire world and is not limited to any region or time. But that's surprising. We first got to really admit that the Christian faith is unnecessary to culture. Can you be good without God? Can you create a civilization without Christ? Some Christians have argued no but I think most have understood that all human beings, whether they recognize God or not, are made in His image, living in His world. There is such a thing as common grace. And so you can have, quote, good pagans who may be better artists than another Christian artist or better husbands than another Christian husband. And equally, you can have great civilizations that have never had any regard 
for God. And we're quick to recognize the merits of the Chinese or the Mayan or the Greek or the Roman or whatever. You could go further, though, and say that the Christian faith is unlikely as a faith to produce civilization. Jesus says, my kingdom is not of this world. And he is relatively indifferent to most of the issues we talk about today in political and global affairs. He repudiates and renounces force, which you need to establish any culture. And you can see that neither he nor his first followers had any discussion or effort to build a culture or create a civilization or whatever. And yet, and yet, it's undeniable that the Christian faith, as I said, is the decisive force in the world's most powerful. Now, of course, if we look at our Western civilization, we owe a great amount to the Greeks. Philosophy, science, democracy, drama, tragedy, literature, and the Greeks were the first Europeans to have a self-awareness that they were not, in this case, Asians. We owe a great deal to the Romans, particularly in America, which prizes the Romans above the Greeks, whereas in Britain we prize the Greeks above the Romans. But law, stability, order, empire, all these things lie much behind, say, the American founders' understanding of the American Republic. And, of course, we owe everything to the Hebrews supremely to their understanding of God and all the difference that a radical ethical monotheism makes and its view of history and human agency and a dozen other things. We owe a lot to all of these. But if you think, we talk of Western civilizations, all of those were Mediterranean. What was it that made it European and then Western? It was the church and the gospel, and particularly the winning of the bloodthirsty barbarian European tribes. And there's no question, if you look at the rise of Western civilization, the church and the gospel were the decisive factors in creating what we see today as the West. And not surprisingly, you look at Western civilization, you say, what's distinctive? Our reforms, our philanthropy, the rise of the modern universities, the rise of modern science, human rights, an indirect link to capitalism, an indirect link to democracy, and so on and so on, all going back to the gospel and the scriptures. Or we can take, as I said, the so-called gentling of the European peoples, which is one of the most important of all, although often passed over without much comment. The Christian faith has a surprising relationship. My kingdom is not of this world, said Jesus, and yet his followers have been influential in the most decisive civilization history has ever seen. A third point. Let's acknowledge the paradox of our Reformation heritage. Don't misunderstand me. Many of you here are Presbyterians. I'm an Anglican, but I'm out of the Reformed heritage, and I'm a proud and grateful heir of the Reformation as an evangelical. Don't misunderstand me. This is the 400th anniversary of the King James Bible this year. We have, incidentally, here the director of the best documentary on this, which I hope you'll look out for. It's called just KJB. He's with us today, and we'll soon have the 500th anniversary of the Reformation itself. And we owe to the Reformation, make no mistake, the rediscovery of the gospel, the restoration of the scriptures, and the re-emphasis on lay people. And all of those are magnificent, and through that, many historians have said the creation of the modern world. But... We've got to acknowledge with realism and humility that the story is a little deeper than that. And I add some factors not to debunk the Reformation, 
But to remember the place of God's sovereignty and grace and sin, which the Reformation also understood very well, and the fact that as we work today in culture, we too must be realistic about what we're doing and deeply humble. Nothing that we work at comes out quite as we hope. The first thing to say about the Reformation is its complexity. We talk of the Reformation, and of course, it's the 16th century Reformation with a capital R. But there were four Reformations. Most of us are the heirs of the second from John Calvin. But there was Luther, there was Zwingli, and there were the Anabaptists. And of course, now we recognize that the so-called Counter-Reformation was itself a Reformation of sorts. So you take even the second Reformation. It has extraordinary sins of commission. Take the iconoclastic movement, which at time destroys the arts in various cultures, tragically, unlike the Counter-Reformation. Or you take the sins of omission. It's almost unbelievable today that the Reformation rediscovered the gospel, but never rediscovered mission. The Counter-Reformation rediscovered mission, and Matteo Ricci and others reached China in the name of the Jesuits, and the Reformation had no missionary movement to speak of. Or you look at one of the great blind spots of the Reformation, the whole notion of the cessation of the work of the Holy Spirit. The Reformation reacted rightly and understandably against the superstition before it. The way that, say, healing and deliverance had become specialized, you went to a saint. You went to a shrine. It had become specialized and commercialized and exploited. An immense superstition. The Reformation threw out the bathwater and, sadly, the baby and said that the work of the Holy Spirit had stopped with the apostles. Clearly, it didn't stop with the apostles in the New Testament. It didn't stop with the apostles in the early church. And it's one of the great mistakes of Protestantism to still keep that belief alive today. And if ever we need both the Word and the Spirit, it's today. But the Reformation in many circles has lost that. Or take, let's be honest, the Reformation's entanglements. The greatest two corruptions of the Christian church in 2,000 years are with political power and financial power, economic power. The Renaissance papacy showed both, and the Reformation attacked both, rightly. But we had our own political entanglements. Thank God, save for Frederick the Wise, the elector, who helped Martin Luther. But Martin Luther got into bed with Philip of Hesse, another elector, and even bypassed his bigamy and his moral flagrant sins because he was supporting Luther. And you can see flowing right down to the 19th century, many of the great Protestant nations created great nationalistic religions. And clearly the political power was the ruler and the church was the tool. So Christian America and its exploitations are not new. But the Reformation has led to its own political entanglements from which we've got to break free. The third problem are the ironies. We say rightly, ideas have consequences, and they do. But never simply and straightforwardly. There are always good ideas, bad ideas, mixed ideas, and ironies, unforeseen consequences. So let's be blunt. The Reformation talked about restoring unity to Europe. And some Reformed people are fighting and splitting ever since. The Reformation talked of restoring supernatural reality, and in places they did. But they've also produced, over several centuries, the most secular societies the world has ever seen. There are enormous ironies, and we've got to face the heritage of the Reformation is paradoxical. And as I said, I said that not to debunk the Reformation, but just so we go in today with all we try to do, with a realism and humility. Nothing ever works out quite as we intend in a fallen world. A fourth point. Explore the secrets of the cultural dynamism 
of the gospel. Getting more constructive and positive here. Why is the gospel in the church so powerful in culture? Well, of course you say it's, it's the Lord. The power of His Word. The power of His Spirit. That's true. But what is it when the gospel and the culture, the Word and the Spirit work in us that makes even frail sinners like us together powerful in culture? Well, there's a key principle that people have noticed, and when the church is true to this, the church is truly culture-shaping. The key principle goes back to our Lord's call that we're called to be in the world, but not of the world. In, but not of. Or as Paul picks it up, be not conformed, but transformed by the renewing of your minds. Oh, in, but not of. Not conformed, but transformed. And when that's lived, it's called social dualism. A tension with culture that makes the church powerful in culture. C.S. Lewis put it one way. He said, there are many religions in the world which are world-affirming. Say, Confucianism or humanism. They are world-affirming. They only have this world, and the whole emphasis is on this world. Then you have other religions of the world which are world-denying. Take, say, Buddhism, described as the most gigantic no to human aspirations in all history. But Lewis pointed out the Christian faith is unique. It's both world-affirming and world-denying. The world was created good, very good. And the church has gloried in all sorts of positive things. Humanity above all, but the arts. And all sorts of other things, including learning. But there's also fasts as well as feasts. And sacrifice as well as fulfillment. And denial, and so on. And the Christian faith is uniquely both. But the deepest formulation of the social tension was St. Augustine's in his great book, The City of God. And that's so important to us because he lived in a time rather like ours. You remember that the conversion of Rome was not actually in 312. Rome, uh, the Christians were allowed after 312 and they were favored after 312. But the real declaring that Roman Empire was Christian was 388 under the Roman Emperor Theodosius. And from 388 onwards were called the Christian times. And believe it or not, they thought the emperor was the second King David. And Rome would conquer the world, and the church through Rome would conquer the world. That was the new understanding of the Great Commission. So these were the Christian times, with the church now identified with Rome. And St. Augustine said, no. In but not of, he said, there are two loves, love of God and love of the self. And because of that, two humanities, those who love God supremely and those who love themselves supremely. And because of that, two cities, the city of God, typified by Jerusalem, and the city of man, typified by Rome, Babylon earlier. And Augustine's point was that the city of God and the city of man are inextricably entangled, intertwined. But ultimately, they are mutually exclusive. And when Christians live in the kingdom to the city of God, in but not of, they are powerful. And it was his breaking with those Christian times and putting the kingdom of God first, in but not of, which laid the siege which took this, the church through the dark ages that were to come. Now, that's the key principle. But there's a key question. We can easily say, in but not of. Not conformed, transformed. Against the world, for the world. All sorts of nice fancy verbal formulations. They roll off the tongue. Nice balance for the mind. But they don't make a halfpenny worth of difference if we're not living them. 
So the key question to ask of the key principle is at any one moment in the church, which is dominant? Is it the Word or is it the world? Is it the Spirit of God or is it the Spirit of the age? Now let's be blunt. The church in America is numerically large compared, say, with Europe and many other parts of the modern world. But it's culturally desperately weak because it's weak and worldly. At point after point after point, the church in America is shaped by the modern world, the world, and not the church. That's not my central point today. I've addressed that, and I'm sure Tim has on many other occasions elsewhere. Now, the key test is conversion. Conversion should be the radical break that is the bridge between an old way of life, an old culture, and a new way of life, and a new culture. And when conversion is as radical as it's supposed to be, that radical about turn of heart, mind, spirit, lifestyle, everything, then the church leads on to a, a new way of life that's shaped by the Word and not by the world. And so you can always look at what conversion means at any moment to see whether the church is likely to be worldly or not. That's incidentally why I think the so-called insider movement in missions to Islam is so dangerous encouraging people to come to Christ and just stay in the mosque. It's those who've broken with the mosque courageously, sometimes at the cost of their life, but the faithfulness and the fruit afterwards are a hundredfold different. But that same challenge comes to the church in America. Look at, say, the born-again movement. And many of you are part of the tail end of that. It started very really. Jimmy Carter's uh, election to the presidency, Chuck Cole's conversion, his book, Born Again. But much of the Born Again movement, looking back, and you can see this whether you examine it sociologically or spiritually, has been a form of religious conformism to the American culture and not a radical breakthrough into a new way of living that marks the kingdom of God. So explore that with great depth, the secret of the cultural dynamism of the gospel. It's the social tension of being in but not of that marks the church at its most powerful. Fifthly, count on the unique dynamics of the kingdom. I say this because the huge discussion that took place last year was half correct. It put in place a good understanding of the secular dynamics of how cultures are changed. You can read a book, for instance, like Randall Collins, The Sociology of Philosophies. Now, I don't suggest you get it lightly. It's 800 pages long. You don't want to drop it on your toe or take it to a beach. <laughs> but if you boil it down to the core of the points made, and they're all good points, you can see how ideas shape culture. And they're easy to say. First, there are three principles. First through leaders rather than followers. Second, through the center of a culture rather than periphery. And third, through networks rather than just through individuals or institutions. Now, we as Christians, and certainly us as evangelicals, have a lot to learn from that. Our Roman Catholic brothers and sisters are much better at the first. They always go for leaders. Now, their danger may be falling over into elitism sometimes, but they rightly see the place of leaders. And we, evangelicals, since the second awakening, not the first, it was led by real leaders and intellectuals, Jonathan Edwards, John Wesley, and so on. But the second awakening, the Cambridge Revival in Kentucky, you can see the populism the suspicion of leaders, the resentment of discipline, the throwing off of hierarchy. So we want it all to be easy, instant, and available to ordinary people. And since then, we've relied on mass movements. And we've been unable to change culture, one of the central weaknesses, say, of the Christian right. 
The second point, too, we've got a lot to learn, although maybe not you people here in New York. In other words, you change culture through the key cultural centers. Again, evangelicals have missed the boat here. It's often said, where are the Jewish people strong? New York, L.A., Chicago, Washington, which are the leading cultural centers of America. Where are Christians strong? Colorado Springs, Orlando, Wheaton. Now, thank God for what's happened here in the last 20 years in New York. But this is rather different and a wonderful thing. But we've a lot to learn on that point. The third point we're much better at. The networks, the disciples, the Benedictines, the Moravians, the Wesley Cell groups, the Clapham Circle of Wilberforce, we're better at that one. But all those three together are only the secular ways of how ideas change culture. Now, clearly, I don't mean secularist, I mean secular. The Apostle Paul is aware of that in his own way. He's always aiming, for example, for Rome, and he finally gets there. But you can also see in the Scriptures the unique dynamics of the kingdom, which are different. And it's not one or the other, it's both and. The first dynamic of the kingdom is the leader is the Spirit. The leader is the Spirit. Take the book of Acts. How does the gospel get to Africa? The Spirit tells Philip to go to a certain crossroads, and he meets the eunuch, and he gets to Ethiopia. How does the gospel get to Europe? Paul is sure the next place should be Bithynia, Asia Minor, and he's battering away, and he cannot get in. Frustrated, the Spirit speaks to him, and from Troas he goes to Philippi. One historian says that when that little rabbi crossed unknown anonymously from Troas to Philippi, that was more history changing in one moment than the great battle of Actium, which took place just 20 miles away. How did the gospel get to the Gentiles? Most of us in the room wouldn't be here today if it hadn't. The Spirit speaks to Peter, and so on. In other words, not vision, mission, all these grand things we have today with our strategic understanding of timelines and next steps and all that. Follow the Spirit, and then we'll really move. Secondly, another unique dynamic of the kingdom are the surprising reversals. I love Luke 3, verse 1. In the day when the emperor was Tiberius and the governor of Judea was Pontius Pilate and the tetrarch of Galilee was Philip, rolls on like that right down to the high priests. And then it says, the word of the Lord came to John in the desert, bypassed all of them, and went to a nobody. And, of course, the whole teaching of our Lord, the first, last, the humble, exalted, the high and mighty, brought down. We're in the upside-down kingdom, and we know that God always works through extraordinary reversals and surprising moves if we're open to Him. And the third principle you can see of the unique dynamics of the kingdom is that culture, Christianly understood, is usually, almost always, a byproduct. It's not a goal, not a name. It's a byproduct. We do have some near exceptions, like, say, Will, William Wilberforce, who at 28 sets out his two great objects and for 47 years pursues them. But as one historian says, how extraordinary rare is it and remember, he died just three days after slavery was abolished. So here's his whole life work and the end of his life, three days apart. And as one historian says, how rare that anyone's termination of their life and the termination of their labors exactly coincide. But actually, many of the greatest influences in history have been unknown to the people who did it. They've been a byproduct as culture most often is. And our Lord, His view of the kingdom is organic, not organizational. It's like a seed that grows surprisingly in the night. It's like a mustard seed 
and so on and so on. Read all our Lord's parables of the kingdom. That notion of the organic, invisible, secret, unstoppable growth is at the heart of so many of them. And you can see today we tend to ignore that in our organizational McKinsey-type world. As T.S. Eliot said in that earlier discussion, you don't build a tree, you grow it. And the same is true of the greatness of Christian culture. Seek first the kingdom of God, living the way of Christ in the world of today, and all these things are what? Added to us. We don't necessarily aim for those as the goal. We seek to be faithful in our lives, in our callings, the kingdom of God in whatever sphere of society we're called to be in, and we leave to God the results. A sixth point. Think through some of the enduring lessons of Christian engagement with culture. It's clear that there is no one Christian culture. There's no golden age behind us. It's ahead of us when Christ comes. Every period in the past, however great, had its flaws, as I said, even about the Reformation. But there are certain lessons of the enduring relationship of the church with culture. And the first is, Success often carries the seeds of failure. I talked about the church at the time of Rome. If you think how extraordinary that the church would become identified uncritically with Rome when Rome was alien, what is less surprising but an even greater capitulation was when the church capitulated to its own culture Christendom. And one writer at the time of Christendom says, I started the story of two cities, and now I'm only writing about one city, the Christian city of Christendom. But that's precisely why they lost this social tension, and it's not surprising that out of Christendom came the greatest evils the church has ever produced in the world. Take the Inquisition. Take the vile slaughter of the Albigensians. Take the excesses of the Crusades in the name of Jesus. Many of the evils of Christendom we are still living down today, but at the time of Christendom, they lost the cultural tension, the social tension, the in, not of, and so they never criticized their own culture. And the fact is, that the moments of success are often carrying the seeds of our failure because we who succeed are sinners. And the one thing that very few of us can argue against ever is our own success. That convinces us. The second of the enduring lessons sounds like a cliche, but it's true. The darkest hour is always before dawn. That is true of every revival. Five minutes before the Spirit speaks, things look terrible. Five minutes after the Word speaks, everything changes. Take, say, Jefferson's predictions that evangelicalism would disappear and the Enlightenment would sweep America, and then came, within one year, the Second Awakening, and Jefferson died a disappointed man. But the same is true of the so-called Dark Ages. We're often blamed for the Dark Ages. The church created the Dark Ages. Nonsense. The Dark Ages were very dark. But what carried through the light of civilization through the Dark Ages was the gospel and the church. And even historians like H.G. Wells admit that Christianity, to quote him, saved learning and civilization. Christopher Dawson says the church was the ark on which it saved through. But the third principle, also counterintuitive, is the church goes forward best by going back first. That sounds crazy in a day of innovation. Everything's got to be new, the newer, the truer, the latest, greatest. You've got the latest app, you're behind, and no one wants to be left behind, technologically left behind, far worse than theologically left behind. That's all wrong for the church. Revival and reformation are actually going back. And if you think the two greatest movements in the West of ideas were the Renaissance, largely pagan, and the Reformation, both of them were movements of going back. 
And the simple fact is, as you see in the Scriptures and you see as history, the church of Jesus goes forward best by going back first. I skipped the last point because of time. But let me draw it together like this. Karl Barth described Martin Luther with this wonderful little picture. He said, Martin Luther was like a man groping his way up the dark, steep steps of a medieval cathedral tower, pitch black. And afraid of stumbling, he reached out for the stair rope in this circular tower. He found the rope and pulled on it to steady himself, and to his amazement, heard a bell ringing above him which woke up the whole countryside. <laughs> it wasn't the stair rope, it was the bell rope. In other words, Luther didn't say, Reformation, vision, mission, timeline, next step, all that sort of stuff. <laughs> Luther wrestled with God, wrestled with his conscience, as almost Tim was saying this morning, wrestled with his times, wrestled with the church in his times, and out of that great man's grappling came what we call the Reformation. I believe we go forward, each of you, with your faith in God, with your callings in the world, in the arts, in politics, in finance, whatever you're in, each of you so wrestling with the Lord honestly, totally, and together, that the Lord knows what may fall out. Christopher Dawson, one of those intellectuals I mentioned earlier, in his discussion he just says, is it possible to think that for a third time the church might be revived in the West, having come to the end of the second time. Then he says, of course, every Christian would answer in the affirmative. But he says, we mustn't answer it too quickly and too easily, because what's at stake today is potentially the whole future, not just of the West, but of humanity. God be with all of us as we play our part in it. Let's move into the discussion.